I'm going to talk not just about lawns, but about your landscape in general, because like I said, your lawn gets to that. It's like one slide in the winter, but there are things that you can do. Um, the, the program is that that first sheet on top there. Um, not that one, that's the soil sample kit, but, and then I've got the shrub pruning calendars for you um, for deciduous shrub, for shrubs, deciduous trees and evergreens. And then um, I have soil sample kit and I have more of those if you think you need more than one. All right, so this is the big thing. Successful preparing your landscape for the winter season ensures a healthy bed in the spring. And that's what we're, we're moving toward. Um, right now, you're getting toward that first frost. Uh, it was 40 degrees at my house this morning, and I loved it. I mean, and everybody's like, oh my gosh, I'm still in my flip-flops, and I didn't wear a jacket, and I was, it was wonderful. So, but we're into that, we're into that time of harvesting the last of our, our vegetables, summer vegetables right now. Um, you can even harvest those green tomatoes if they don't, if you're uh, looking at some frost, you know, go ahead and harvest those green tomatoes, make you some chow chow, fried green tomatoes, that type of thing. Yes. So I got one tomato. Mm -hmm. And that's because the deer kept eating my tomatoes. Keep them away. That's another yeah, seminar. Well, yeah, that is another seminar. That's uh, <laughs> um, were they in were they in pot ever anything? They were in a garden so, and, and I yeah. I didn't have it fence, but I did everything else they say to do, but so putting out hair, peeing around it, putting out our spring, they get used to it. Mm -hmm. I tell people that you need to look at it like this. You and I move. We move into this new house and it's beside a railroad track. Man, we cannot get to sleep because of this train that goes by. And it goes by all night long. So we're like, we are moving out. So we move out, and now we can't go to sleep because it's too warm. <laughs> Deer are like that. So they move in, they're like, oh, something's off. They come in, well, something's still off. But if it's continually still off, it becomes a part of their habitat. So truly, Truly, the only true way to keep them out is a fence that is at least eight foot high because they can jump mm -hmm. that far up. And, yes, but you need to have at the six foot mark, you need to have something that's going to come out. Either that or you lay your fence like this. And you can actually do a four foot fence. They cannot judge distance. So okay. anything that messes with their depth perception at a 45 degree angle will help to keep them out. All right. Because I knew they were jump over the fence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that 45 degree angle messes with their depth perception. I even had one of them fussing at me because I'm sitting beside the bus. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's literally fussing at me. Yeah. <laughs> Blowing and and, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So <laughs> there's still planting to do right now because to me, nothing tastes better than good old cold crops, broccoli, cabbages, cauliflower. Uh, rutabaga, turnips, your leaf lettuces, mustards, um, any of your uh, greens can be planted right now and they're good up until frost. Um, then there's some flowering bulbs that you can put in. If you go and look, there's a lot of bulbs out right now that would come up next year. Now's the time to be planting those bulbs. You can also do garlic and rhubarb and you want to do that before the ground freezes. And usually in our area, the, gra the ground, now frost is different from ground freeze. So our average first frost date is around October the 15th. Um, the ground freezes usually sometime in January. Herbaceous perennials should be cut back to just above the crown of the plant. So this is, I'm talking like your coral bells, uh, your lilies, any of your um, um, types of um, bulb type of plants should be cut back just to above the crown. Lorite. Lorite. Well, now see, here's, here's about Lorite, and this is all a personal preference. Some people think, and Lorite will make it through the winter, but then they kind of get ugly. Um, the rule of thumb is to leave it for the winter, because it does go semi-dormant, and then to cut it back in the spring so that you get that new growth and you're cutting off all the ugly. Okay. Um, annual plants should be completely removed from the garden. That can be a little tough, but um, they should be completely re removed. And now's a good time if you haven't started it to go ahead and start that compost bin or one type of compost pile. 
So we can use any of that refuse and, and turn it into that organic matter. The problem we worry about is disease debris, anything with insects and diseases. Insects, not so much, but disease definitely usually will not get warm enough in a compost pile to completely kill all of those diseases out. So that's one reason, and I'll give you an example. So boxwood blight, um, the, the municipalities will not take that as a curbside and put it into the mulch pile anymore because those, that mulch does not um, decompose enough for it not to spread the, the spores. Some plants, such as ornamental grasses, provide winter interest. So if it provides winter interest, leave it. It's always pretty. If you've ever looked outside in the winter and had some ornamental grasses or anything that leaves you those little puffs, it also leaves some, usually some seeds and things for your birds during the winter time. Also in areas where you have prone to erosion, it's better to go ahead and leave dead stems. So I'm gonna give you an example. Um, there's, a, there's a small hill very, it's an incline where there's some day, um, day lilies, still adore lilies. And we actually recommend that they, instead of cutting those back, to actually leave those leaves and it acts as a compost and it, and it holds that bank up. And they're easily raked away in the spring as the new stuff comes off. Um, in the cases where plants can be left until later winter or early spring, and make sure to cut back the dead stems before the new foliage comes up. Pruning trees and shrubs. A lot of them can be done in late winter um, and early spring. That's why I provided you with this, the shrub pruning calendars. Um, misconception, myth, wives' tale, that type of thing is that all trees, especially deciduous trees, can be pruned and should be pruned in the fall. Not necessarily true. So if you look at your deciduous tree pruning calendar, um, and we see on, and I'm gonna give you an example, decisions tree. Maple is the number one thing that I like to show people, but if you look at the very beginning of it, look how many things should be pruned in June and July. Um, the black areas are when they should not be pruned at all because it can cause um, litter damage. If it's open, that means it doesn't matter when you actually prune it. Okay, so if you look and then on the back, there's still a lot of June and July. There are not many in the fall. They're, they're there, but that's not the prime time, time to do it. So that's a misconception. Um, that's why I brought these because that's, you know, when people say, well, you need to prune that. Yeah, you need to prune that in the fall, not necessarily, okay? Um, it really should be done other times of the year. The same is true for shrubs. If we look over, um, there's a lot of shrubs that should be pruned November, December through, through March. So that's a good time to prune. They are in the dormant stage. And because of that, then um, pruning those back at that time prevents them from getting hit back. We really don't want to prune anything past July. If you notice there's, no, there's pretty much nothing in August, September, and October. There's very few. And the reason why is those have the potential. When you cut a plant, that plant tells itself, I've been cut, I need to put out new growth. So even in the winter time, even if it's not the time for it to do it, it, it will, or in the, in the fall, it'll try to put out new growth. You've probably even seen blooms come out on azaleas and things get, you know, get kind of confused. Um, and they will actually do that if the temperatures get just right um, during that time. So we avoid pruning during that time so that it has time to harden off before it goes into the winter season. So this is mild pruning and or massive. That's massive or massive pruning usually. So if you see this little heart-shaped little leaf, yeah. um, that's when you should do any of your massive pruning. Massive pruning, what does that mean? So there are a few shrubs and that can handle what we call rejuvenation cut. Um, azaleas can handle a rejuvenation cut, not every year. What is a rejuvenation cut? That's anywhere where you're cutting down as low as eight inches from the ground. Um, those should be done in June and July, right after they bloom. Mm -hmm. um, forsythia, uh, butterfly bush, um, things like that can really benefit from rejuvenation cuts. But it's not an every year rejuvenation cut. You can't co continually cut it down. It's got to have enough food source every time you cut it down to keep the roots sustainable. Um, but the, the rule of thumb is to 
look at your plant and you're going to size it up and you take one third of the entire plant. So that's from the sides and the top. You gauge it. You're like, okay, here's, here's this third, here's this third, here's this third. And then you do it this way too. So here's this third, this third, and this third. So you can take a third overall, which means you can't take this and this, that's taking two thirds. So then you come out and say, okay, well, this was four inches, so I can take two inches on each side. This is 12 inches, so I can take three inches or four inches, four inches off of this side, sorry. I have a forsythia, so we bought this house two years ago, but this forsythia has one trunk that's like this long, mm -hmm. the few little branches on the end of it. What can I do with that? So that's probably a very old forsythia and it's probably been cut way back. And unfortunately, it, it didn't do well with that rejuvenation cut. Um, you may get new growth on the new growth. Um, coming from that trunk, it's probably not going to get very much more from that. So if I cut that trunk back, will that encourage it to get new growth, possibly? Maybe, but that sounds like that's what was done and probably done right before you bought the house because it was overgrown. So they cut it back. And that does happen. So better to just do it up and start it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there again, I, I've already stated the second one. Pruning in the fall leaves those stems vulnerable for dieback. Um, dead or damaged limbs can be re removed at any time. You're not hurting anything by doing that, by removing those dead or damaged limbs, because it's only inviting in insects and diseases at that point. Leaves, we all love them, right? Yeah, so clean up a fallen leaves may be needed, especially if you have large leaf trees, maples, sycamores, oaks, things like that. However, you can turn them into black gold, all right? Um, they're great um, to turn them into a soil enhancer. So dry leaves can be plowed or tilled under in your vegetable or annual gardens in the fall. You can dig and till fresh leaves also into your garden for a better soil. Um, so, you know, if they're not turned brown, they've just fallen, that's considered a fresh leaf if it's not brown. That can be done too, but it needs to be done this time of year. So it has a chance to decompose and it doesn't take up that nitrogen that it's used in that decomposition away from your plants in the spring. Never put green or live anything as a mulch, okay? Because what happens is, all of that decomposes. As that decomposition process happens, it takes up the nitrogen that is in that soil and uses it as the green part of the carbon to nitrogen ratio, which then takes it away from your plants. Also, because it heats up for that matter, it can burn your roots or it can also cause some damage around the bottom of the plant. So that's why they say if it's not truly composted, it burns your plants, that's what it does. It leaves it with no food or, or so let me go back. Shouldn't say no food. Um, so let's talk about fertilizer and, and food. And, and I will tell you a story. I was an extension, when I first started an extension in 2001, one of my master gardeners came in at Betty for the first time. I was actually on the telephone and he just came and sat down. I was like, well, okay, who's this dude that just walks in and sits down? And he's sitting there and he's, he's, he sits like this. And I get off the phone, I'm like, hi, may I help you? He says, hi, I'm Louis Judson. I'm one of your master gardeners. And he said, um, I taught um, soils at a junior college in Ohio. All right. He says, so I have one question for you, new agent. Are fertilizers food? says plant food on the box, says plant food on the bag. And I must have passed because I said, I've been taught that plants make their own food through photosynthesis of their leaves. Mm -hmm. He goes, like you already, we're gonna get along. <laughs> so <laughs> fertilizers are technically vitamins, mm -hmm. okay? They are like us taking a vitamin. We can live on bread and water alone, but we are not optimal. We're not, that's not our optimal meal. Um, the biggest factor in allowing the soils that you have, your native soils, to provide the nutrients your plants need or to know what pH that plant needs and provide. It unlocks or it can lock up those nutrients depending on if the soil is too acidic, if it's too alkaline, it locks those. If you've ever seen a pH scale for a plant, 
it's real thin and it comes up and it does this. And in that optimal pH scale is where all of those nutrients it needs are unlocked. They are available. Can they be leached out? Yes, absolutely. They can be sucked out of the ground. That's where when we add fertilizers um, or any type of compost, organic matter, it's allowing for that, that process to start over in the soil. Organic matter does not necessarily provide nutrients. It's not a true nutrient provider. What organic matter does, excuse me, is it allows for those nutrients that are available to actually rejuvenate and become nutrients again within the soil. Okay. Okay, I have a trick question for you. Okay. I know if you put green matter on top of dirt, mm -hmm. that leaches the nitrogen. Correct. It, you need that nitrogen to decompose that. Correct. What if there's a barrier between the green material and soil? Will nitrogen seep through the... <gasps> yes. So I want you to think about a cold, a cold compost pile. Okay. So, and we actually keep this, if we don't, it, we have a grass pile down behind mom and dad's house. And that pile is only used when we have to bush hole the yard because it's rained so much and we have to get it up. That pile has been there for years and we can go under the bottom and pull out that rich organic matter that's composted. However, in a cold compost pile, it will continue to break down from the bottom up okay. because all of that nitrogen, it's still using what's in there. I was thinking about one of those uh, pulse. Yep. Mm -mm. It, yep. Leech. it leaches right okay. through it. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. Shredding your leaves first, of course, help break it down quicker because you don't have as much that you have to go through. So it's better if you if you want to have um, really good success or make it work fast than shredding it. And be sure to mix those into the soil rather than leaving them on top. Um, and that helps prevent keeping the soil too cold and wet when you're working in the spring. Because if you, especially if you're leaving whole leaves, because if you know how whole leaves sit, you know, yeah. and believe it or not, you know, we, we're, if you're, if you're one like me, you're like, I'm one with nature and what falls, falls and what grows, grows, what's there is there. But if you have thick ground cover, and this can include leaves in the summertime and you're sitting out and you go, why are there so many mosquitoes? It literally takes an eighth of an inch of a drop of water for a mosquito larva to actually become an adult. So in the springtime or in the summer when we have all the rain, if, when we have rains, ivy is one of the worst for that. And people, so it'll actually hold just enough water for there to be mosquitoes. I yep. usually just wait until spring to turn it, but I should do it in the fall. It's better if you can. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're working in bins, um, they pretty much compost themselves and then you get that fresh and flat gold. Um, if you've ever wondered what real dirt smells like, that's what it smells like. And if you roll down your window and you drive through Iowa and Indiana and Ohio where it's all flat, that's what it smells like. They still have organic matter because they do less and less of cultivation, tilling. So if you can work with a, any type of ground cover, um, cover crop such as annual rye or oats or something like that. The reason we say annual is because as soon as the temperatures reach 75 degrees, it starts to die back um, and it doesn't seed out before that time. Um, what about yellow clover? Um, so yellow, yes, yellow clover, you can do that as well. The only thing is the reason I recommend the other yellow clover is a little expensive if you're, if you're just using it as a cover crop. But the great thing about the yellow clover is it's a nitrogenization you know, it's a legume, so it does provide that nitrogen back into the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard of yellow clover. Is it the same thing as white clover? Oh, no, no, it's no. not. It's, it's a lot like um, crimson clover. So crimson, true crimson, crimson clover is an annual. Um, that's, that's different than red clover. Red clover is actually a perennial. That's the one that only gets about uh, eight inches tall. It gets a little, it's more of a pink. But crimson clover can get up to 12 to 14 inches tall. Um, it has the really big clover leaves on it. 
Um, and it's a true almost magenta color. It's an annual yellow clover is just, it's golden color, it's beautiful. Um, and it will last on up into, it's an annual, but it will last until temperatures reach about 75, 80 degrees. So a lot of bees like to work it in the spring. White clover is a perennial. And so it comes back every year from, from the root system. Some people call it a weed. I leave it there because I don't have to fertilize my own. We used to use white clover and bluegrass in combination in Kentucky. Yeah, and a lot of people will do that. It just depends on if they want clover in that haylage. If they're using it as a ground cover to provide that nitrogen back into the soil, they'll use it. Um, they'll t they'll drill it in in the in the fall, and then it comes up. It grows during the winter time, kind of like winter wheat and you know snow peas and things like that. Same same kind of concept, but then it dies back. And they don't have it in the roughage. Well, it's a perennial. How do you get it out of your garden? Golden is not. Oh. Golden and crimson is not. Okay. Red and white is. Okay. So it will be in your garden. And you can chill it. You're chopping up the roots, which will spread it. Yeah, but if it's a perennial, and the, you white, the white one, yeah. yeah. yes. will come. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, white clover <laughs> is completely different than. Okay. Yeah, I don't either. So. So tree leaves can be recycled directly on the lawn, but you need to make sure they're shredded. Okay, pretty shredded. So you're going to use a, a power mower or shredder. We actually do this at my house every year, um, and it uh, breaks down the dry leaves into a lot smaller pieces. If you use a mulching blade on the mower, it speeds up that process. Even a standard blade will do an adequate job. For larger leaves like maple, oak, and sycamore, it can take several passes to get it fine enough for that product. Um, so we don't rake up the leaves in my yard. We actually mow over them. And that's how we, we do it. And we'll do seven several passes, several passes over it. Um, a fall application of nitrogen fertilizer, about one pound of nitrogen, nitrogen per thousand square feet will help speed decomposition of the leaves and benefit the grass plants. So you're actually, adding to it, the plants are not actively growing. You're, so the reason it works, that's correct. And that's why we recommend to fertilize in the fall, okay? So the root system is storing it as a carbohydrate ready for it to go in the spring. So putting down, if you wait till after your leaves fall and you pulverize them and then you fertilize, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're able to get that carbon to nitrogen ratio for compost. That compost is able to use some of the nitrogen to decompose those leaves as well as bring it down into the soil. So now you've got organic matter as well as the nitrogen that's ready to go for the spring. Um, they also make great composting ingredients. So if you're needing something in your compost bin that um, provides that, you can mix it with your green trimmings and your grass clippings. Again, the smaller the pieces, the faster they'll break down. Uh, if you don't have green trimmings or grass clippings, you add a source of nitrogen. Um, you can add manures or you can add nitrogen fertilizer. Some of those people who are, you know, all natural think that that's like a sin. But if you're looking for compost, adding some synthetic nitrogen will actually help to break it down quicker. For so you. can you get nitrogen by itself? Yes, you can order. Yeah, so um, um, sodium nitrate is nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think about next year. Now's the time to be doing that. When you're going into the winter, think about next year. Um, reflect back on what worked for you and what didn't, what you liked and what you didn't like. Um, so pulling out those dying plants and discarding any diseased plants away from your garden. Uh, before you till the garden, uh, plot for the last time in the fall, add that layer of organic matter. But also know now's the time to say, hmm, my tomatoes didn't do well in this one spot, or I got late blight in this one spot, so I need to make sure that uh, I use that rotation. The problem that we have with traditional garden cultivation is those of you who have a garden, do you till? Do you till the soil? Okay. So rotation is really a moot point because if you had late light, 
and late blight uh, spores can actually stay active in the soil up to seven years. There's a lot of actual pathogenic diseases that will last that long, as well as seeds. Um, crabgrass seeds can lay dormant for up to seven years before they will germinate, just waiting. Um, the problem we have with, with the way we normally do is when we, when we till and we have our rows, we till like this, okay? You're tilling and then you're back, and then you're back. We don't tend to till in a square. So okay. that place, well, if you do, that's good. The thing that, but the thing about it is when you're tilling the entire thing all at one time, you're just spreading it. It sticks to the times. Um, if you are actually tilling in your little squares, you need to make sure that you are disinfecting those tines before you move to the next one with a 10% 10, 10 bleach solution, okay? Um, so yeah, so actual um, traditional cultivation just pulls it all the way through, so. What if you're, you're making a new garden? Grass, oh, yep. solid grass. A lot of the times the, the, the mistake we make is not disinfecting our tines before we do that. So it could be stuck to that. So just make sure you clean whatever you're using, whether it be a tractor, you know, or, or even a hand, hand tiller, um, disinfect those blades, disinfect them with a 10% bleach solution before you, you start to do it. You're not normally going to have those diseases in that area because it's laid fallow and it has not had a host. Um, that is not to say that it's not close enough that you may have, especially with insects, that insects will find whatever you're doing. My suggestion is we do what we call a trap crop. And so in the area that you did have it, let's say you're moving things to this one, you know you have potato beetles, so you're gonna do potatoes over here. Then you plant a few potatoes huh. in this spot, okay? Are you telling me to plant tomato plants from a deer? You can. <laughs> you, I mean, you can't, you laugh, but I'll talk about that no, here in just know, a second. Yeah. But what that does is because they're in this area, that's a trap crop. So then you make sure they come out, they, you see the adults, you remove them and destroy them. That's a way of, of helping with control. So using a trap crop in a different area and then moving other crops away helps to move those insects away as well. Um, if you use manure, be sure that it is not fresh. That is one of the worst things that you could actually put on any garden. Again, high in nitrogen and will truly burn wherever you're trying to plant. Adding most of your garden beds can be done in the spring or fall. One thing that we do recommend is if you are mulching beds that have perennial shrubs in them, you can actually wait until we have a ground freeze. And I know that sounds really weird, but what it does is when you have a ground freeze, all that water that's in the soil becomes ice. It becomes a solid. It's no longer available to the root system. If you wait for that ground freeze and you wait for that first heave and then you put, you put down that mulch, what it does is it thaws it and then it keeps it warm, okay, under that layer. And now you have water that's available and more than likely you're not going to get a true ground freeze or, or heaving under that mulch layer. But you want to wait because if you don't, then that mulch then becomes part of that soil. Mm -hmm. And that's why. Mm -hmm. okay. it late. Yeah, it's better to, well, actually it's better to do it in January. Yep. After the first freeze, after the first ground freeze. Are you getting mulch at the, oh, yeah. at the lumber yard? Uh, Max Kendall. Uh, Phillips. I don't know about Phillips. Not sure. You may be able to. Yeah. yeah, you may be able to. You could ask them. Um, here is one of the things that we do wrong. We mulch too, too heavily. Um, we want it to look pretty. So two to three inches is about right. And it really doesn't need to be done every year. So, um, you know, we have a tendency to want to put mulch down every year because it's pretty. 
best thing to do is to go and rake it and turn it over because that fresh batch of mulch is still there. It's just covered by what's been sun, sun bleached for the most part, okay? Um, usually true mulching only needs to be done about every three to five years, depending on the breakdown in your lawn, in your area, and also what kind you use. So if you go back out, with, out here into the parking lot, you'll notice how they just mulched with that brown mulch. Dyed mulches, if you pick that up, that dyed mulch is actually pallets. They take pallets and they recycle them and they dye them and they don't break down very fast. Okay. If you want a good mulch, you want this at least double shredded. Triple shredded is preferred. And you want the one that's black. I know it's not pretty, but it's decomposed at that point. And um, that's what you really would like to use so that it breaks down into that organic matter and moves it into the soil as it heats. All right, you want me to hear my boo-boo? Sure. Uh, mulching, I, I just kept mulching around peon, uh, peonies. I call them I say, peonies. I call them peonies. I had to correct myself. I call them And peonies. it really got too deep for them mm -hmm. because, you, you know, just see the crowns on peonies. And with, I just mulched around thinking I was doing something good. And then they eventually just stopped bleeding because yeah. they just got too deep. Yeah, because what will happen is that because they can't, come up and actually have that foliage yeah. to produce the food, the yeah. bowl just dies out. So keep up, uh, let's go to the lawn real quick since that's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> keep a map of thinning or bare spots on your lawn. If you have any suspicious turf that you're wondering if it's diseased or if it's just thinning out, you can bring it by the extension office and we can let you know what's going on. Um, and, you know, that way we can prepare you of what kind of controls you need to, to do with that. Or basically just tell you, you know, that you just need to oversee and doing it at the right time. Identify any weeds that you have um, and prepare for control measures the following spring. Winter annuals. Winter annuals such as chickweed, henbit, dead nettle can be controlled with late fall and early winter application of pre-emergent herbicides. So we actually would like to start seeing those pre-emergents put down at the end of October. You can do them as late as the 1st of January. Um, if same thing goes, and I'm going to give you an example, crabgrass, we recommend two applications, one in the middle of February and then again in the middle of March because a lot of the times um, it doesn't hit all of those seeds with that, that pre-emergent. Pre-emergent prevents those annual seeds from germinating. So if you have a particular area where those types of weeds happen to be a problem, then pre-emergent is one of the best ways to take care of it. Wire grass is a grass and unfortunately has to be taken care of with a non-selective spray such as glyphosate, which is Roundup. Uh, Roundup's just the name, glyphosate is the active ingredient. But again, because it's non-selective, specifically says non-selective, that means it does not care what you spray it on, it's gonna kill it. If it's in a flower bed, you do have some options. The way these uh, herbicides work for the most part is they are systemic. They have to have leaf contact in order to circulate through the system through their photosynthesis and all of that type of stuff. That's how it works and it carries it back down into the root system as a food in the same transport, okay? If it's in a flower bed, it's very tedious, but if you have shrubs, you can wrap them in plastic and spray around. As long as that does not touch the leaf, it will not kill it. So you can also do this, let's say you have a pump sprayer which is what the majority of us have. You may be lucky and have a backpack sprayer, but that's too heavy for me. So you can actually take a two liter bottle or you can even take a, a milk jug and tape it to the end of your wand. And you can do spot sprays. The biggest thing is making sure that the wind is not blowing more than three miles an hour, three to five and make sure that it is not above 80 degrees outside when you do it. Because what happens is they become volatile and they rise up as a gas and that's when they move off if it's too hot, okay? And it's windy. That's why that recommendation is there. 
But if you take that and you spot spray there, that, that wire grass, it has to be actively growing. Actively growing. It has to have some green on it somewhere. So before the frost, if that's what you're wanting to do because it's getting ready to go dormant, it's carrying that food back into the root system at a more concentrated rate right now. So you spot spray it, you leave that container on there for about 60 seconds, lift it up, move to your next spot. That allows everything that's inside of that little container to completely dissipate and fall. Okay, So that it is not acting as a mist that's going to get up onto the leaves of other things. Okay. My neighbor did me a favor while I was gone for a month or so. Came over with his lawnmower and mowed water. Uh, oh, uh-huh. So he distributed. I didn't have any wire grass. Yeah. Until the next year. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, crepe myrtles, I like to see their legs. Okay. Mm -hmm. You like them as a tree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm, now I've got all these suckers, and mm -hmm. it just takes forever. Right. I can't spray those little suckers. No, you spray those suckers, you kill the tree. It should be easier. To Even if you see them, because they're really bad about putting out sprigs from their root systems, you spray those, it gets into the root system. Mm -hmm. Oh. So okay. be careful. Yeah, I probably just killed some. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> just be careful. It may not be yeah. enough, but. Yeah. And do know that the woodier they are, the hardier they are. So um, if you've sprayed them when they're in that semi-woody to woody state, you may just kill the leaves off of it. That's why I use them like vinegar and things. Vinegar or any type of acid is considered a weed killer. But if you even look at our pest management guide, it's for seed, the seedling stage. Trying to use it on a, especially a perennial type of, of weed like wiregrass or clover or even dandelion it kills back the top it burns it back but then it comes back from the root system it doesn't it does not get to the root system it's it's a contact type of, of herbicide so have you considered what plants you'd like to produce well in 2022 2019 2013 um if you've kept a plan of your vegetables and flower garden you would do well to consider which plants thrived and which did not right now. Now's the time to make your plan and what you're thinking about doing. Rotate your vegetable crops each year to prevent that insect and disease damage. Um, adjust plantings, transplant throughout the summer and figure out what might work for the next year. You can get a soil test kit that's offered by us. The kit we give you for free. This costs you absolutely nothing. Virginia Tech is who wants your money, not me. Okay. So if you choose to do one of these, they are $10. There are some extras that you can do with this. You can actually pay a little extra to get how much organic matter you have. And you can also check for soluble salt. So if you're having, you think you have some issues with some salt, um, they'll check for that for an extra $2. Uh, we have found that the best way to do to ship these, if you only have one box, then you can wrap it in brown paper and ship it out that way. If you have multiple boxes, get a priority mailbox where pretty much costs one amount to send that and, and stack them in there that way. Um, perhaps this is the year for you to learn about your soils and uh, what amendments are best for which crops you have. And garden on. That's the end. Are there any questions? When I make that new garden, should I remove on the clumps of grass once I tilled it. Yes, it's to the best of your ability. Um, even if you're tilling it in the winter or, or, or late when it's supposed to be semi dormant, what can happen is any little bit of that root system get, gets hung, then you're going to have it. As much as I hate to use herbicides all the time, the recommendation to get a true new soil till is to kill back that grass. Kill it back, you need to do it pretty soon because it's actively growing right now. You need to do it before the frost hits, okay? And it needs to be covered, it's gonna be the perfect time yep. to do it. And then, and then if you can do it as soon as you can, the blades are open, so it's gonna take that down into it really quick. So, so I should cut it with the mower first, then spray it? Then spray it, okay. and then spray it. 
And then after I've done that, how long should I wait before I turn? Believe it or not, you can actually, it's, so if you use something like glyphosate and, and, um, so research has shown that glyphosate has a half-life of two days. That's it. Doesn't stick around in the soil, doesn't leach. So when you think about the safety of glyphosate, because there's been all of these things about, you know, Roundup. Yeah. One thing you need to remember about Roundup, I'm not advocating for it or against it, but these lawsuits have been determined by a jury. They have not been determined. They have not been removed by the USDA. They have not been removed by the FDA. So, um, you know, I could probably come up and say that my skin cancer was caused because something hot fell on my chin and now I have a skin cancer. And I would get money whether that was true or not. You know, I mean, if a, if a man can get if a man can get money because a hot pickle fell on his wife's face and it made her unattractive, you can get money for anything. So my recommendation is to try to wait a week. Give it a good chance to move completely down into that root system. Good herbicides can take up to two weeks to work. You'll see the burn back. You'll see the chlorosis and the discoloration. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, I sprayed that Roundup on it like a week ago and it's still here. You have to let it get into the root system right. to work. And it can take up to a good two weeks for good herbicides to do a job. So, and I'm going to use uh, VDOT as an example, when they spray the edges, and you probably noticed this summer, you could, you could see that line uh -huh. on 220 and 58 in the places exactly where that pesticide hit, but they actually sprayed that two and a half weeks before we started to see the brown. Yeah. So. It's a lot further where the wire grass is starting mm -hmm. to take over. Okay. It's going to rain this weekend. Mm -hmm. I waste my time putting Roundup on it this afternoon. You want Roundup to be able to dry completely. That is all it needs. So, but I will tell you, it's too windy to put Roundup on it right now. I, if I can see limbs blowing, if you can see a flag, flag waving, now if you see one just kind of hanging there and doing this, but if you see one that's it's too windy. Um, I don't foresee us having our first frost next week. I've checked the weather, you know, frost, get, we need to get down to at least 34 degrees. It's nice 40 this morning and I loved every minute of it. But, um, yeah. I'm sure it probably did. It was 40 when I left the house at, at well, at eight o'clock. Yeah. And I was about three o'clock, four o'clock is the coldest part of the day. Yeah, well, actually, actually, it's about five or six. So you're, yeah, yeah, if you look at it, it's right before sunrise. So we're up next week after the rest. Yes. So I'd like to know too, because here's here's a the thing. There's also a weed that somewhat mimics, I shouldn't say mimics, it's completely different from wiregrass, and it's called nimble wheel or nimble weed, nimble wheel, nimble. The difference is it is it does not creep like wiregrass. It's very similar in the leaf blade, but it's usually a little wider. It does turn completely brown, but it it is not actually wiregrass. However, with that being said, it's still taken care of the same way because it's a grassy weed. I'm sure this is wiregrass because after a, after a rain, I which starts creeping across the street. Okay. I'll grab it and start pulling it yeah. up. So that's going to be you know, wire grass or Bermuda grass. Yep. Yeah. 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 Concrete. So uh, after that's the rain, not windy, next week, mm -hmm. probably be a good time. Yes. Uh, don't waste money on fertilizer if I'm going to put it down. Depends on if you're planning to overseed it. You still have time. Well, I've got time. I need to uh, determine which one I'm going to do. Seed and let the wire grass come back next year, or right. So you can actually plant grass seed two days after you spray Roundup because it has a two day half life 
and it's not a pre-emergent, it doesn't prevent germination. Okay, the reason why we made that, that two-day determination is because it does have a two-day lifespan, which means within those two days, if it gets really hot, it can become volatile and move off as a, as a gas, okay? It's not gonna get that hot. You're not gonna have to worry about that. So that's why in the fall, if you're gonna do any type of renovation that way, you can spray it with the glyphosate and then within two days, you can recede. And so will that grass come up this fall? Yes. Like this fall? So what, it should germinate because it's a cool season grass. That way it has a good chance for that root system to, to get established and hopefully help you choke out whatever is remaining of that wire grass. Now, if you don't think you're gonna have areas of really big bald spots, you can spray it, let it go dormant, um, stay there just to hold your soil because once you start digging up, you have bald spots and you really don't want that with snow, all that kind of stuff. In the spring, if you see any green again, you can spray it again. We still don't recommend at that point. You can overseed, but just know your success rate is going to be the best in the fall as temperatures are descending versus the ascending. What's mm -hmm. actually do our full so about this house, mm -hmm. and it has been, the front yard, the yard period has been Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we do have two large willow oaks mm -hmm. in the front yard, which I know do compete. Exactly, yes. <laughs> um, so we have cut those back to get more sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so we want you to start all over again okay. with the lawn. So should I just kill everything that is in that front yard? Yes. And start over. Absolutely. So and actually do some type of furrowing or tilling or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And then as we reseed and straw it, because we're going to have to straw it, mm -hmm. um, what type of grass should we, should we put our winter rye mixed in with the seed? If you want to have some type of cover, you do a 60 40 combination of your fescue and rye. That's with the knowledge that you're going to come back in the spring and oversee that other 40% with fescue. Okay, and oversee again. So, what kind of fescue did you say? Eat your turf type blend, whichever you choose. Um, under those trees, you might want to do within your turf type blend. So, you're doing a 60 40 of rye, well, fescue to rye. Within that fescue blend, you're also going to do a 60-40 blend of the fine fescue, 40% fine fescue, 60% um, tall fescue blend. That fine fescue is going to give you that drought and shade tolerance that you may see once you start completely over. Okay, so you're 60 to 40 of fescue and rye, and within that 60, 60 to 40%, 40% fine fescue, 60% tall fescue. Yes, and not Kentucky 31, a tall fescue turf blend. Kentucky 31 is a pasture grass and it's very clumpy and it's not, it's the cheapest, but it's not meant to be mown. And besides, that's kind of tough on the feet. Yeah. And, and a lot of the times that's what contractors will do for new home homes because it is the cheapest, it will come up. But then you're, you know, year, year and a half, if it ever makes it, if it does make it through the summer because it dies back or it's being mown too much and it, it goes through a drought. Um, and then you start to see bare spots. And that's why even with new houses that have that grass that comes up in the spring and it's beautiful when they put it down. Because it's being mown at that, you know, three inches every week to every other week, which is not supposed to be done, and then you go through a drought situation, you just lose it, and that's why new lawns don't make it. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're going to put, okay, I've got weeds. i got weeds in the backyard. Is it green? It's green. Okay, then. And I'm, I'm just old. kidding. Me yeah. too. I'm <laughs> and sometimes I say, oh, you lazy person, you need to do something, but if... If, if I were to do something, mm -hmm. I put down pre-emergent for some of them. So pre-emergent's only for annual weeds, only for annuals. Dandelions are not annuals. They're actually perennials, but can act as an annual. 
Yeah. Okay, because they're, they're seed spread. Uh, annual weeds are crabgrass, goosegrass, um, chickweed, henbit with henbit and dead nettle or the little purple ones. Um, if you've got things like black medic, which looks like lespedeza, if yeah, you've got if you've got um, uh, buckhorn plantain or flat leaf plantain, that okay. So plantain is a perennial. So putting down a pre-emergent isn't going to do anything for those. They're not producing by seed. They're coming back from the root system. And that's why a systemic herbicide. And like, again, I'm not an advocate for spraying herbicides on everything. But if that's what you are choosing to do, then that's the course of action you need to take. Me, like now. I said, now. you can do some now. Some are done best in the spring when they're most tender. Right, right. Some are best done now. Actually, dandelion, if you got dandelion, now's a great time to do dandelion. Black medic, no, because black medic, as the summer goes on, becomes woody. So you need to wait for the new growth to come back out and hit it in the spring before okay, it becomes so woody. So the annual, so put down pre-emergent now. Yes. Before it starts raining. If it's a winter annual. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So chickweed, henbit. Yeah. That's a winter annual. Yeah. Yes. If you got crabgrass. Um, annual bluegrass, things like that that you don't want, then that's when you put it down in February or March. Okay, so I I, I, I just say I put down the pre-emergent and then I put down fertilizer mm -hmm. and then later on I we see. Yep. Now if I'm doing the, the uh, new lawn thing, do I, I still need to do pre-emergent now? You can. Here's the problem you run into. You do not put the pre-emergent down until after your grass comes up. Gotcha. It needs to be at least three inches tall. Okay. Because it, it can shock it back with a little bit of toxicity, but it will prevent for three months from your grass seed coming up. And that's one mistake people make yeah. is that they'll put down pre-emergent and then they come back and they try to oversee their lawn and nothing comes up. Well, you're preventing all that seed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Seed. Yeah. Seed care. What kind of seed so, it is. Seed. Um, so probably what I would recommend for this season, uh, if you get a good, if you're, you're running that, that late season of putting down a winter pre-emergent, um, get that good stand of grass up first and then hit it back in February if you're worried about some of those summer animals. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm worried about the plantain because I know that the pre-emergent is going to work. No, pre-emergent is not going to work. But when I, when I do the whole show everything, that's yes. just take care of mm -hmm. And you, you are right on the brink of, of all of this falling into place. Um, reseeding really needs to be done by the 1st of November. That's kind of the latest. So um, I know we, we, you're like, well, it's just the first of October, but when you start planning in your head what all you got to do, it goes from days to weeks. Mm -hmm. it, you know, yeah. start planning something like this, like the first of September, so that you have those few couple of months to work with it. That doesn't mean, you know, you need to keep this in mind that because you are on that late end of it, you may see yourself overseeing the next couple of years just to get a good stand. Do that heavy overseeing in the fall, not in the spring. Anything else? I appreciate my posse. Y'all are my, you're, you're my, my regulars for coming. I know, I've enjoyed every, every class I've attended. I don't know, um, I know um, Erica has put out a little um, evaluation there. If you're interested in seeing something like this next year, uh, anything in particular, I know we did the basic vegetables. Um, we did the one class of the basic vegetable, but if, if there's something that you were interested in, and you're like, yes, I will come to that. Okay. I want to know more about muscadine grapes. I want to know more about certain vegetables. I want to know more about, put it down, because that gives me the opportunity to know what you are looking for and lets me prepare to give those presentations. So you want to know more about everything on that. <laughs> I am really, really weak 
in understanding the chemistry of the soil. Okay. In what fashion? Like in in how bedrock, how how we become organic matter, or how nutrients work within the soil to become available to plants, all of the above. Well, that might protect. You know, if if I do a soil test, I do not know how to read that thing. Right. And I There's try a book not list. to put. I try not to put fertilizer. You know, in my garden spots. Right. Uh, I feel like we get enough chemicals right. throughout life without having, you know, you have a chance to actually um, grow something. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, it's not completely organic. I, I know, I know, but anyway, uh, but I don't know like what to add to the soil once I get that soil test, you know, what's good. For right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other than, you know, adding nitrogen or phosphorus. Or yeah, potassium. where do I get that nitrogen without using a fertilizer? Yeah, manure. Oh, I like that then. Yes, manure. Okay. All right. See, that's what I'm, yeah. um, that's what I'm weak on. So manures are one of your best nitrogen um, sources that you have, making sure it's not fresh. Yes. Um, yes. But, so let's say you could get manure right now. But they say manure, chicken manure should be at least six months um, composted. Cow manure needs to be at least four months composted. Horse manure needs to be a year. Okay, if you don't have, okay, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. If you don't have it that length of time, can you put it in your soil now and have it a chance to decompose or is that just robbing what nice So it is that? gonna have, it is gonna use what's in there, but then again, you have to realize the reason why we say put the leaves and put the manure and yeah. do it now is because what it does is, yes, it uses some nitrogen in the soil, but then it becomes your, it's full of nitrogen, and then it becomes your nitrogen. Okay, so it's okay if it's not that composted time right. to go ahead and put it in soil if you're not going to use, if the bed's going to be more. Right. Yeah. And the, the reason why horse manure is more is because they're not a ruminant, and so uh, the weed seeds do not break down, and using any type of horse manure has weeds in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if they you eat weeds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, if you think about it, when they poop it out, it looks like the same thing you feed a rabbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So because it's not a true, it it hasn't it hasn't gone through the system like chicken manure is pretty much all liquid. Um, cow manure is pretty much all liquid. All that's broken down because it goes through all four of those stomachs in yeah. order for yeah. it to get, and then. Cut. It's also that first ruminant. Rumen. They bring it back up. They chew it again, and then they send it back down. So but I've heard that horse manure really is more potent. Chicken manure is the most potent. Right. Horse manure is potent, but the reason that it is a bad thing is if it's not truly set right for that year. All right. I'm just going to put down the chemistry. Okay. You don't understand what I will. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you very, very much. You're very, very welcome.